This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, for the long table today, Aneko Hiriart, who uh, comes to us from the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique at uh, Bordeaux Montaigne University. And uh, he's speaking on a very underrepresented topic on our ANS long tables. You get a lot of Greek and Roman coinage and American coinage and things like that, but he's speaking about uh, Celtic coinage, uh, which gives us something new and exciting and different uh, as opposed to what we're accustomed to. And um, the reason I reached out and invited Aneko to, to present at a long table is because he co-authored a very great article in the American Journal of Numismatics a couple of years ago. So if you go to AJN 2021, you'll see an article he co-authored with Julia Genichese on um, gold and silver ingots across continent, uh, Celtic continental Europe and monetary use. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Aneko. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. First of all, I would, I would, thank, uh, I would like to thank the ANS for the invitation and especially Nathan and, and Emma. And today I would like to take you back to the earliest days of coinage in Western Europe. It's crucial to understand how this transcendent innovation came into being we will investigate the form of this first coinage. Above all, we will try to understand the way coins were introduced and we will focus on their circulation and their impact on local populations. In particular, we will be looking the, uh, at the emergence of coins in a large part of continental Europe, between the Carpathians in the east and the Atlantic Ocean in the west. This era maintained secular relations with its Mediterranean neighbors. Nevertheless, there is a significant chronological gap between the appearance of the first coins among the Greeks and the Celts. So, what do we mean by Celtic Europe? It was a vast geographical area shown here in uh, light red, inhabited by people who share many common traits. For example, they speak the same language and share a common material culture. As we see, this area is at the interface and crossroads of many cultural domains, the Iberians, the Greeks, with Emporion, Marseille, Rode, Rome, of, for sure, the Basco Aquitanian, the Thracian, and the Dacian further east. The emergence of coinage must be seen against a background of strong interactions. We must also consider the turbulent geopolitical context between the Macedonian conquest, the Punic Wars, and the gradual expansion of the Roman Empire. The theme of Celtic Europe describes broad trends, but it can also give a false sense of uniformity. In fact, this theme conceals an incredible territorial, ethnic, and political fragmentation. What we have is a mosaic made up of a multiple of people and authorities. This ethnical, diverse, and fragmented reality is related to us by Greco-Latin literary sources like Pliny, Caesar, or Strabo. But in fact, we know very little about this population who never wrote about themselves. This patchwork arrangement explains the extreme diversity of Celtic coinage, which offer one of the most abundant and complex typological repertories of antiquity. Indeed, several hundreds of mines have been identified. In many cases, 
there is still considerable mystery surrounding the attribution. So let's take a look at the origins of early coinage in Europe. My presentation will be divided in two main parts. First, I will talk about the first coins to appear in the Celtic world. We will identify the main, the main trends and see if any oppositions are emerging on an European, European scale. Next, we will look at the context in which these early coins were used. Is their use anecdotal or can we already speak of a monetarized society as soon as the coin was introduced? So before looking at how coins appeared in continental Europe, let's widen the focus and look at what happened on the Mediterranean scale. The first coins appeared towards the end of the 7th century BC in Lydia, in present-day Turkey. This map shows the spread of this innovation around the Mediterranean basin. The innovation was soon widely adopted, mainly by the Greeks. Within a few decades, many cities began minting coins. At the very western end of the Mediterranean, Marseille and Emporion inaugurated their means around 520 BC, only a century after Lydia. Now, we will try to analyze how indigenous populations, whether Celtic or Iberian, came into contact with the first coins. Let's Take a look at the Western Mediterranean around the Greek city of Emporion, located in Catalonia. This first map on the left shows the distributions of small Emporian fractions minted in the 5th and the 4th century, centuries BC. In this early period, Celts and Iberians were not yet minting coins. As expected, Emporion's early coins circulated around the Greek city. Several hordes, such as uh, the one on the right, were found in the city's quarter. But surprisingly, we find a decentralized spread north of the Pyrenees. Indeed, a second area of distribution can be observed around the Odd Valley in Celtic territory. Let's move forward in time with this second map on the right. 200 years later, in the third century BC, local Celtic populations began minting their first coins. In Southern France, these imitated the Emporion Dragma. On the map, Celtic imitations are represented by blue dots. They circulate north of the Pyrenees, precisely where Emporion fraction used to circulate before. In the map of the, of the left. The red dots show the Greek Dragma minted by Emporion in the third century BC. They circulate, they circulate around the city, but unlike the previous period, they are no longer found north of the Pyrenees. When Celtic imitations appeared, they drove the originals out of the circulation. We have a strict spatial superposition according to a configuration that seems fully orchestrated. This leads us to an important point. So indigenous populations 
trade daily with their Greek neighbors. They knew about coins. Indeed, coins have been discovered, discovered on their territory. So why don't they produce their own? So let's get one thing straight. If it takes them more than two centuries to mint their own coins, this is in no way reflect archaism. Not producing coins is a deliberate act. Exchanges within indigenous societies are based on traditional economic modalities. These are probably based on debt and ensure the cohesion of social groups. Introducing a new tool, such as money or coin, potentially involves structural risk that challenge existing hierarchies and social models. Now, let's look at uh, the European scale. The first Celtic coins were not creations ex nihilo with their own types and iconography, no. They were systematic limitations of coins circulating around the Mediterranean during this period. The Celts drew inspiration from several prototypes to mint their first coins. I will show you some examples with the Greek original above and the, their authentic imitations below. So first of all, we have on the left, a silver dragma of Emporion with a female head on the right and the legend Emporiton in Greek. The reverse feature a standing horse with a victory on top. The Celtic imitation at the bottom is a little, is a little stylized, but the elements of the original are perfectly recognizable. Even the legend, while approximative, is correctly transcribed. In the middle, we see a starter of Alexander the Great with a helmeted head of Athena on the right and the winged Nike on the reverse. Below, the imitation is also very close to the, to the original, but with coarser features. Finally, I present the starter of Philip II of Macedonia with the head of Apollo on the right and a biga on the reverse with the legend Philippou in Greek. This coin was one of the most imitated by Celtic populations. The lower imitations, the lower imitation, sorry, is one of the oldest Celtic coin. It was discovered in a old not far, for, not far from Bordeaux. The finesse of engraving and the fidelity of the reproductions are really striking. Even the legend is identical. Such, such examples show just how difficult it can be to distinguish between the Greek original and Celtic imitation. These cases highlight that imitations not only faithfully reproduce the iconography of their prototypes. The Celts also respect the metal, gold or silver, of their models. Moreover, they strictly respected the weight of the original. Thus, the first Emporion imitations weighted 4.80 grams, just like the Greek dragma, and the Philip II imitation weighted 8.60 grams, just like their prototypes. Imitation exceeds simple iconographic inspiration. It demonstrates a clear intention by Celts to follow an already existing, known, and recognized, and recognized system of value. So let's look at a few more examples to complete the picture. On the left, 
you, you have a dragma of of, of Rode. Rode is a, is a small uh, Greek, Greek city in Catalonia, a few kilometers from uh, from Emporion. It minted a number of curious coins, characterized by a reverse showing a rose from below. The stem is represented by the central bud and the petals by crescents. Imitations repeat this pattern, becoming, becoming progressively more and more schematized. The rose tends to turn into a cross and the petals into crescents. So go to the center and we move now to uh, Central Europe. So let's consider the coins of Philip II of Macedonia and their imitations. The first imitations in the middle uh, features the laureate head of Zeus on the right and the horseman on the reverse. The legends, the legends are modified and new attributes are introduced, such here like a, like a tree scale. As the process continues, the shapes become more stretched and distorted until they become a succession of arc, strokes, dot, or S. With uh, this last example on the right, I wanted to show you the progressive deformation of the Philippou legend, Greek legend, on the, strat on the starters. If the first ones are perfectly reproduced, the transcription quickly deteriorates. We soon end up with an indistinct succession of strokes, clearly showing that the calques no longer understood what was written. The legend becomes a mere decorative element. On these examples, we have stretched the chronological framework a little. We can see that a gradual stylization is taking place. The Celts are freeing themselves from the prototype and taking more and more creative freedom. Motifs, because motifs become more abstract, distorted by a succession of geometric shapes. Celtic art, therefore is characterized by a unique wealth of inventiveness. With these first consideration, considerations in mind, it is interesting to look at a map of Europe to see if there are any geographical trends. This map clearly shows that depending on where we are, we won't imitate the same model. The choice of a prototype therefore responds to a singular dynamic that may be defined by more or less extensive, extensive territories. For example, here, around the Pyrenees between Catalonia and the Atlantic, Emporion and Rode Dragmas were imitated. Further to the right, here, between the Rhone Valley and the north of the Alps, northern Italy, Marseille, co Marseille coins were used as models, ovals on one side and drag mass on the other. In the large part, in the, in, in a large part of, um, of northern Gaul, we find imitations of Philip II of Macedonia. On the other end, Macedonian coins, those um, of Philip II here and Alexander III here, remain the main influence on early Central, Central European coinage. Finally, in Eastern Europe, the tetradrams of Tassos and Alexander served as prototypes. Beyond these main influences, the map also reveals another striking feature. 
there is a north-south division according to the metal used for the first means. Gold imitations seem to be limited to the north of a line running from the Garonne to the Danube via the Alps. South of this line, only silver prototypes are copied. This line could mark a cultural break between two opposing visions of value standards, one based on silver metal, the other on gold. These initial conclusions are based solely on observation of a schematic map. As such, their scientific value is limited. To test these interpretations, we need to go back to the material data. To this end, as part of a collective work, we have compiled, compiled an inventory of earliest Celtic coins across Europe. More than 4,000 coins dating from the third century BC have been inventoried. Using this corpus, we are able for the first time to produce maps based on real and exhaustive data. As a result of this work, I'm showing you trend maps or heat maps, which indicate the frequency of finds of a particular method. On the left, gold coins are confined to a large northern half of Europe, and they are virtually absent south of the Garonne, the Alps, and the Danube. Conversely, on the right, silver coins are found in south of the area. This document seems to confirm our initial impressions and highlight the gold-silver opposition. However, not all areas fit into this dichotomy. At the interface between these two domains, several regions exhibit gold-silver bimetallism, such as the case of the border region, as well as the Swiss and the chess zones. We can therefore deduce that the use of either method is not exclusive. So here, like uh, Nathan do before, did before, I wanted to extend this reflection and to mention a work that we published in the American Journal of Numismatics with uh, Julia Genichesi. We carried out an investigation into gold and silver ingots discovered in all Europe. The aim was to carry out a first inventory and to think about the possible use, the, the possible monetary use. The European distribution of these ingots show, show, shows dynamics similar to those of coins. A large northern half of France only delivers gold bars, gold ingots. And in the southern France and in central Europe, the quantities are greater and we have also silver. And in these regions, we have both gold and silver uh, ingots. So now I wanted to extend this reflection to the wall of the Iron Age to see if these boundaries to spread of gold were perennial. Here, the map includes all gold coins found from the third century to the first century BC. We focus on the dynamics between France and Spain to the south. The Garonne River here remains a durable boundary on European scale. Through the Iron Age, no gold coins were found south of the river, either around the Pyrenees 
or through the whole Iberian Peninsula. So here there is another map that only consider hordes. Nearly 200 treasures are recorded and show the proportion of monetary methyl in each of them. The circles you see here um, are proportional diagrams. Most of them, like as you see, are of a single color, indicating that the odds are mostly single method. There are only a few cases um, where is this is not the case. The great majority of fins are 100% silver and are characterized by their monometallism. This is true on both the northern and southern slopes of the Pyrenees. And gold only holds are found in the north, only in the north. And at the interface of the two zones, only one old AMA in Dordogne had both gold and silver coins, only one. Of course, these metallic dichotomies raise a number of questions. First hypothesis that comes to mind is linked to available resources. Does the presence of means of, means of a given metal explain the use of that particular meter, metal by populations. Here, we are focused on gold. To answer this question, we have compared the distribution of mining districts exploited in the antiquity on the right with that of coins of the same metal, gold, on the left. A first look suggests a certain correlation between the metal used and the mining. The use of gold is exclusively confined to a large northern half of the country, it is France, where most gold mines are also located. But they are also strong contrasts that escape logical mine coin interpretation. In Limousin, for example, here, more than 17 tons. 70 tons of gold, 17, sorry, uh, of gold were, mini, were mined during the Iron Age. However, the coinage of these peoples was essentially silver, while gold played a much smaller role. Another example, example lead us to consider the, here the Basque uh, gold mines mentioned by Strabo as very prolific also. However, as we, has, we have seen before, gold never was the metal standard in Aquitaine, in Aquitania, this role being exclusively played by silver. In reality, the picture is more complex, and the choice of this or that metal certainly reflects deeper cultural considerations. This brings us back to our schematic map of early coinage. This map is very useful for the visualization and for visualizing certain major trends, but is also too simplistic. It hides much more complex realities. If we want a deeper understanding of this phenomena, we need to break away from them and directly question the facts. Sorry. Here. So the example here shows that uh, the picture is not as static as we have seen. Here, you have two coins from the south of France. On the right, um, both coins feature a female, female head surrounded by three dolphins a direct imitation of Emporion drive. On the reverse, the armed rider could be inspired by a coin from maybe Taranto. 
but the most interesting element comes from the legend. Despite belonging to the same series, the legend differ between the two coins. On the left, the legend Emporit refers to Emporion. And on the right, a retrograde Greek legend reads Philippou. This legend is obviously imitated from that on the starters of Philip II of Macedonia. In other words, the same coins combines influences from Emporion, Tarento, and Macedonia. In this way, influences are neither exclusive or static. And multiple hybridations have been documented. The third, the third century BC should be seen as a period of artistic and cultural ferment. Celtic and gravers were highly creative, feeding off a multiple or multitude of influences. We are now going to look at a fundamental question the use of the first coins. Was their use anecdotal, or could we already speak of a monetarized society when the first coins were introduced? I'm going to draw on recent research and extensive data databases. So we begin by examining the circulation dynamics of imitations of Philip II of Macedonia. During the third century BC, these were not only coins, sorry, uh, these were the only coins in circulation in much of France, Switzerland, and Belgium. These give us a good idea of how coins were first used by uh, in this vast territory. Two observations can be made. Firstly, these coins were widely distributed. And secondly, we are struck by the small number of finds. The legend on the right shows that in the vast majority of cases, they are isolated discoveries of one single specimen. The biggest find was a single point here with three coins. These gold coins were very valuable which could partly justify the low number of finds. But that doesn't entirely explain it. This map shows a very sparse circulation. It suggests that the use of these coins was almost anecdotal and certainly, and certainly not very regular. Indeed, it seems that the monetarization of the economy is still a long way off. We therefore need to consider the possible parallel, parallel use of these coins. These coins can certainly be qualified as special purpose money, whose use is compartmentalized and probably linked to a very small fringe of society. Some archaeological associations may provide some clues. In several holds, gold coins are associated with torques, those gold necklaces worn by Celtic aristocrats and warriors. One example is the Jersey hold, which weighed nearly a ton and contained several torques. The meanwhile, the Tayak Old on the right contained 4,000 coins in two separate vases, each containing half of the same gold torque. There are also a number of coins featuring torques, as we've seen here in the middle with the Regenbogen Schusselchen. So there seems to be a certain duality between torque and coin. The talk is closely linked to the aristocracy. 
but it is also an object with high symbolic meaning. Gold coins, like torques, also have a strong symbolic value and were probably used for purposes linked with the aristocracy. However, Philip II's imitations already represent a substantial reserve of wealth and do not constitute all purpose money. Their use will be more closely related to social money in the sense of money used to create, maintain, and reorganize relations between people, dowries, diplomatic gifts, fines, and so on. These coins may, well, may also have been used for exceptional economic transactions, such as war. The Celts, who were used to serving as mercenaries for Mediterranean nations, may have imitated the coins and used them to finance their own, their own wars. However, these practices should be interpreted in the light of their historical context. The third century BC was characterized by the omnipresence of war and competition between aristocrats. The elites played a key role in the introduction of the first coins in temperate Europe. Coins probably contribute to their social reproduction. Moreover, before the appearance of first coins, we know that other forms of money existed as early as the Bronze Age, like bronze axes, for example. From the third century BC onwards, coins became part of a transfer process. They gradually replace other objects that have previously played similar roles in ritual or social practices. In this way, the advent of the coin fits into a certain continuity of use and doesn't necessarily imply, imply a drastic break. So the example of Philip II of Macedonia imitation shows that early Celtic coins were not always fungible in the economy, mainly within non-monetarized communities. However, should this premonitized state be generalized to all Celtic societies of the third century BC? New data we will enable us to better understand potentially different monetary uses. Here, we will look at the circulation of two other complementary coinages in two distinct parts of Europe. So let's start with Southern Gaul and imitation of Rode Dragmas. These coins have an opposite circulation dynamic to that of Philip II imitations. All are found north of the Pyrenees around the diagonal that links the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. High concentrations can be found at few sites where dozens of examples can be found. La Cos, Ace, or La Perouse, for example. All these sites are large open agglomerations. Some of the first towns to appear in temperate Europe. On closer inspections, road imitations can be divided in many different series. Here you can see a sample on, on, on the screen. Each of these series can be defined geographically. They have a nuclear circulation that revolves around few sites. Each authority affirms and distinguish itself. But beyond these differences, all the types belong to the same grid wall and follow the same standards. We are probably already in a monetary confederation where these different types are 
interchangeable. So let's go a thousand miles further east to Central Europe. Let's study the circulation of Athena Alkis starters deriving from the coins of Alexander the Great. We are currently studying the Czech Republic, Austria, and Poland. These coins circulate widely between Danube and Ode rivers on the Amber Road. Like road imitations, they are found exclusively at few sites like Poseldor, Nemčice, or Nova Serequia in Poland. Here too, all these settlements correspond to the same profile, open agglomerations. Finally, we can see that even if they are gold coins, the concentrations are very high. These coins are found in dozens, even hundreds. In the case of Philip's imitations, we have seen that some of the first issues were linked to social uses. But we have just seen other examples where the earliest Celtic coins are clearly part of a complexification of economic practices. Indeed, in the first century BC, the first traces of monetarization seem to appear at the same time from one end of Europe to the other on a limited number of sites. These sites include Nemchice, Rosaldorf, Lacoste, or La Perouse, all of which fit the same profile. They are unfortified settlements extending over several dozens hectares. These sites exhibit a high level of artisanal and commercial activity. This transformations common to several hundred miles apart are not the result of chance. We need to explore this avenue further. What evidence suggests that trade was becoming monetized for the first time in temperate Europe. In the same settlement, several factors indicate early monetization of transaction. Firstly, we note the abundance of monetary fines, uh, testified a high volume of production and probably also a regular use. Secondly, there is a wide range of fractions. Here, you can see a large range of submultiples of Athena Alkis type from one starter on the left to the one twenty-fourth of starter on the right. So later, where it's just uh, 0 0.3 grams. As a scale, I have put one cent next to it. So this allows you to visualize just how small these fractions are. This complex divisional system shows that monetization is already underway. Thirdly, monetary facies from open agglomeration clearly indicates trade. Coins discovered at widely separated sites are closely related and belong to the same coin series. Let's compare the facies of the main sites. In Central Europe, on the top, Roseldorf, Nemchice fractions, silver, and Athenalkis, gold starters, make up more than two thirds of the fines. In Southern uh, Gaul, in Ace, Lacoste, and La Perouse, imitations of Rodet drums are in majority followed by Marseille obols. 
in each of the study windows, the similarities underline the need to share common exchange values. Roseldorf, Nemtice, and Nova Serifia, on the one hand, Lacoste, La Perouse, Ace, on the other, integrate the same economic confederation with common value standards and monetary systems. Finally, one of the most interesting clues is provided by raw ecological context. At Roseldorf in Austria, uh, on the right, and Lacoste in France on the left, most of these coins were discovered in empty spaces interpreted as marketplaces. These major observations suggest that coin is essentially used in a dedicated space whose function is devoted to trade. Once again, we must emphasize the concordance of this phenomena several hundred miles apart. So to conclude, this talk highlighted a number of paradoxical situations. With Philip's imitations, we have seen that these early coins essentially took on social functions, helping to reorganize relations between elites. They also participated in exceptional transactions, but remained the prerogative of very few individuals. So even if the coins was a new object, its introduction into Celtic societies did not, in fact, represent a revolution. However, very soon after the appearance of first coins, and perhaps at the same time, a turning point was reached in certain places. In some settlements, coins were introduced into everyday transactions and were frequently used here. In this site, in this settlement, the monetarization of the economy was part of a wider process resulting from structural changes in part of Celtic societies. Some of the most important innovations took root in the third century BC. These include urbanization, with the appearance of the first towns, a rise in trade and commercial activities, and the standardization of craft industries. Coins were part of this global momentum. The coin, therefore, has many applications. These uses are not necessarily contradictory as they reflect complex societies, at once similar and diverse, permeable to external influences and deeply traditional. Within these multiple societies, the coin lies at the, in the, at the intersection of the human economy and the market economy. So I thank you very much. <laughs>